G'day, welcome, kia ora, good to see you all here today. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, just to give you a bit of a background, um, Woodney is a, a, a forestry consulting company based in Masterton. Um, we've now associated with FOMS, uh, it's a harvest marketing company that has 50 uh, harvest crews across New Zealand. Um, I started with Woodnet uh, about seven or eight years ago, and we've been involved in the ETS scheme uh, pretty much since its, since its origin. Um, one thing that's very uh, clear about the ETS for me is that a small amount of information is very dangerous. Um, context is crucial. Um, you'll see from the presentation today that there's a lot of information involved in the ETS, and to do the ETS in a nutshell, the next layer down is quite comprehensive, so um, just, just bear that in mind. Um, we were at this presentation was based on a field day presentation I did uh, with the Willows and Poplars in, in Masterton, and one of the t-shirts I was wearing at the time had several photographs taken of it. It was a, a TUI t-shirt, year right, and it said, everybody understands the ETS. Um, but when you live and breathe it, uh, I guess it it becomes second nature. So uh, this is a snapshot. We know it. Trust us. This is just a bit of an idea. Uh, so let's get started. I'm going to have to turn to see some of it. Short. <laughs> okay. So the ETS in a nutshell is a voluntary scheme. Uh, it's, it's in five-year compliance periods. So started in 2008 through to 2012, etc. Any land registered prior to 2002, the, this current compliance period, can claim carbon back to 2018. Uh, the four years of vol voluntary emissions are followed by a mandatory year. So you claim your carbon emissions uh, based on the increase of carbon for that year. So um, there's a lot of people say, carbon, I can't see it, what's the story there? But you've got to think of it as the growth ring. You can see a growth ring and the carbon that that, that tree has sequestered or, or sucked up during that time. So all forest types have, uh, have different uh, growth curves and uh, like any growth curve, the increase decreases as the, as the stem matures. So just as a bit of an example here, the first 10 years of growth of a forest stand from, from beginning, you've got pine, 210 units of hectare, and just as a, just as a snapshot, because we all care about what the money pops out at the end, at $21 uh, for carbon, that's 4,410 a hectare over that 10-year period. Um, and specifically, we're going to talk today a little bit about hardwoods and the erosion control on that. And it's interesting to know that hardwoods across that first 10-year period are actually slightly more than pine. And you'll see jump just above that $5,000 a hectare in that first 10 years. It's based on the 21. So ETS in a nutshell, what's the take home today pretty much at the beginning is carbon is a legitimate forest product uh, with manageable obligations. Um, we'll go into this in, in further in a minute, but the enduring carbon of a forest makes this a lot more attractive. Um, under the current rules, the first 10 years of carbon growth, if it's claimed, doesn't have to be surrendered or replanted. And that's a bit of a game changer in terms of the, the, the forest industry is, you know, you've got in, um, expenditure, expenditure in a crop at the end, but the ETS allows you to uh, get value from your, from your crop at, a, at an earlier stage. Uh, with, the, um, with the ETS averaging and the harvested wood products that's currently coming in through the ETS review, um, that 10 years can increase to 16 or 20, and that's to be confirmed. And that's kind of what this slide here um, explains. So you've got the general sawtooth model there on the blue, uh, which is the standard crop rotation. So you've got a, a growth from one, and then you've got a fell and the reduction in carbon that appears there. So usually that reduction would, would um, be, be a, uh, a deficit in an emissions return and a, and a decline. Um, with the review, the two options that are coming in are, are harvested wood products, which is the, uh, the red line there, and you can see the, 
that's, that's recognising the, uh, the value of the carbon that you can see around you that doesn't uh, dissipate over the 10 years. So the wooden stage that I'm standing on still currently retains carbon, so that's that, the, the, the carbon that's in the, that harvested product. And then you've got averaging uh, that comes through there as well, so that's going to be an option under the scheme and uh, it's just a matter of how they, how they bring that in. And that is looking at the growth of carbon and you're able to retain up to the average of the crop uh, that, that you have. And so when the fell takes place, that carbon isn't required to be surrendered, so you can claim up to that average. So the potential and what we're talking about in terms of enduring carbon is the point at which the carbon doesn't fall below in the life of the crops on the, on the ground. So the current, you're looking at the first 10 years-ish, or that, that piece there. With harvested wood products, you can see that increase. And as I say, the, these are yet to be confirmed. They will be brought in. It's just as to how that's going to happen. And the averaging, you can see that potential really increase. The important thing to remember with enduring carbon, and it was called safe carbon initially, uh, which was a little bit of a faux pas in terms of that, um, it's, uh, is that it needs to be claimed at the start of a rotation. So the scheme started in 2008, and you can see, obviously, the life of the stand and, and the zero age on the left there. In order to take advantage of the enduring carbon that you aren't required to hand back, you had to have claimed that the, the, ideally the first 10 years or the, the majority of that time because this, you could only claim from 2008 the closer to you are to the planting and establishment at 2008 the, uh, the, the greater your, your ability to take advantage of that enduring carbon. Uh, working with accountants and lawyers and such, one of the biggest pitfalls and, and things that isn't understood about the ETS, and there's a bit of a take home here today, is that the carbon units are linked to the trees and the registered party. So in terms of the trees, the removal for any reason in terms of fire, wind, harvest, etc., is the surrender of units, or probably, probably what I should say there is a negative carbon on your return because you'll have a different calculation for each stand and the different treatment and the different situation for each of those crops that, that go through. And the land, big one here, 40% uh, or, or in any entity change or a forestry right requires a transfer. Um, and uh, there are some rules around uh, penalties that can apply if you uh, process this after time. And there's a massive team at MPI that are well behind in processing these. And with land transfers and things like that, I guess it comes into play if you, the rules are relatively complicated, but if you, if you, if you know the gist, you can prepare. Um, and also, obviously, deregistration uh, requires the surrender of all of your units. In terms of land and eligibility, uh, the, uh, the nutshell is really it has to be post-1989 land. And, and in a nutshell, that pretty much means that it shouldn't have been forest at the first of the first 1990, midnight of. There's some really good historical imagery across New Zealand, and uh, we, we use that to determine what was present at the time. MPI uh, got uh, some resources from, from overseas about two or three years ago, and their decision making on what was eligible and what wasn't eligible uh, changed slightly in terms of that. And in terms of uh, the land, it must meet the forest definition when submitted. Um, and this is where this kind of the, the other the other the other take home is about what is forest land, what is eligible, and uh, the forest land definition um, comes into play in in the ETS as well as other other areas of MPI. So you've got a species, a tree species five metres in height. It includes manuka as long as it can reach five metres at that location. Um, greater than a hectare, uh, less than 15 metres between each potential canopy edge, and that's talking about drip line. Um, uh, greater than 30 uh, metre average width, and uh, greater than 30 metre potential canopy cover, as well as less than a hectare gap removed. 
So once we're working with that, um, it's really amazing what stands you can join together, existing hardwood stands, current small, uh, small forestry blocks, as well as um, native areas that have either been retired or can link areas together. Uh, under 100 hectares in the emissions trading scheme, you use the standard or regional tables that are provided by MPI, uh, which are based on areas within New Zealand for pine and uh, nationally for, for other species. Over 100 hectares, uh, we've got the field measurement approach, which is where you're required to measure specific plots within your forest, provide those, that data to MPI, and they can create your own carbon tables. You'll often find that that is, can be a lot higher uh, than the regional tables, depending on what you've actually got on your land and how thick and what age, etc. So now just getting into, um, but that, that, that's the nutshell of the ETS. Um, getting into uh, erosion coal control plantings, um, this, the presenter earlier talked about New Zealand having young soils, and uh, at the field day I was recently at in the Wairarapa, um, one of the questions that someone quite rightly uh, asked, which was an interesting one, said, what, um, what other species are other countries using other than poplar and willow to, to hold land together? And... Um, Ian McIver from the Poplar and Willow Trust said that back in the 1950s, Poplar and Willows uh, were ch chosen from a plethora of options as the best option for New Zealand. But in terms of answering the question, he said, not really anything, because New Zealand is so unique. Uh, there aren't a lot of countries in the world that are actually in our position in terms of having such young soils, um, reduced vegetation, etc. And so the hardwoods plantings and these... Um, protecting these young soils from storm and wind events are, are really crucial for New Zealand. And, um, you know, working with the local councils, it's really great to see them ramping those up and, uh, and promoting that and incentivising. But the, the, I guess the point alongside that is that ETS can complement existing land use decisions. You can plant a carbon forest and, and all the rest, but it makes sense to say, as we all know, what's your best land use? And if it's vegetation, what type of vegetation? You know, being with a, in a beef and lamb conference here, we're knowing that, you know, your hardwood plantings, they're holding your soil together, they're, um, they're, they're protecting and holding the land, but you've also got that um, the ability to graze through and you're not, you're not locking up any areas as such. So, in specifically for the willow and poplar plantings, what are the things to watch out for? Um, and this, this comes down to how, how we sort of manage that. Um, the cultivars that are coming through uh, now um, have a much reduced canopy size, which obviously increases the, the, the grass underneath, et cetera, and limits the, the amount of leaf fall. Um, they've, they've, I've got just as much in terms of the, the root uh, extensions. But because of the re reduced canopy size, that, that limits the... Um, the potential mapping distance. So that's something you've really got to watch out for, and I think it's something that, that will, be, will be more of a factor in the future as those plantings grow through. There's a, a buffer zone that we can work with uh, four metres between stems. The, um, the recommended distance that, that I heard talked about was about uh, 20, 15 to 20 metres between stems, ideally, to, to hold large areas together in terms of creating a root mass underneath. And that fits in ideally with the ETS in terms of where you can, um, can map around. Uh, anything more than that, and, um, and you're starting to, to lose the ability to, for it to meet that forest land definition. The other one that makes a particular uh, reference to with the poplar and willows is that 30% canopy cover. When you've got trees dotted around or large gaps within, um, it's really important to assess that. Um, and you can increase uh, the stocking in some places as well as be a little bit sneaky about what you don't put in. So you can disclude some areas to, to bring up the percentage and stuff, but that's just some of the things that we consider when we're, we're mapping is specifically for the ETS. Um, and the shape of the stand is important, and I think this is one of the one of the biggest ones for, for hardwoods and willows. It's um, I find it a bit of a game. I'm a bit of a geek in terms of mapping in GIS to see how much I can get in and and that potential and how, how that how that can work to the greatest advantage of, of what's already there. 
But you can also, uh, as, you, as you're doing your planting, you might be doing 100 poles or you know, how many poles per year. Some people have those schemes uh, currently in place with their farm plans. But it's, you know, if you put an extra 10 poles in an area, you can uh, bridge an area and increase the, your eligibility and, and actually link areas that are existing for a very, very small outlay um, of, of some existing trees. Those trees are very important though. Uh, with, uh, with poplar and willows, the location of each tree is quite crucial and therefore attrition is, is obviously a big one. Um, this is a this is just a a, um, a practical example of a client we have with 70 hectares registered in the ETS. Um, the green there is the forest stands. You can see they kind of look a bit octopusy in terms of in terms of their shape, unlike pine. Um, we've got a stretch there between 1992 and 2000 establishment, but there's a potential to increase that. Uh, there are some areas that were too small and we can go back in with some poles and increase those areas. There was a photo up, I should have ideally sourced those. There was a, a storm event at this location about 30, 33 years ago or so and the black and white image that they showed was just astounding. I actually live very near on neighbouring this property and the black and white image almost looked like there were lahars coming down because of the scarring that had occurred. I mean, this won't be new to, to anybody, but personally, riding through this place on my horse, it's like see, seeing what it was 30 years ago and seeing it now is just phenomenal. Uh, and, and the, the great job that, that the planting and that um, that, that has, has had on the land. So in terms of the actual um, carbon potential of that particular property, um, registering in 2008, that's just a bit of a screenshot there of the totals of the carbon that have, um, have been accrued. Um, so just for the purposes of this exercise, we're going through to 2022 because we've started that period. So we're looking at a 15-year example of the 70 hectare property. So you're looking at an average of 1,516 units um, per hectare across this property. Sorry, yeah. So $21 a unit on that 15-year total, um, just under 32,000 per annum in terms of current prices today, which is 454 units a hectare. Boop, boop. Um, and like anything, you'll see that middle, middle column there of the New Zealand unit. Um, you know, it was 2,000 units um, for the stand for that 2008 years sequestration or, or the, the, the growth of carbon during that time. And back in 2022, you can see that it's, that it's reduced considerably, and that's just simply because the increase in growth is declining as it reaches its peak, and as it continues to grow as it matures. But as we add f some future plantings into that, that, that could change considerably as well. So points to remember in terms of specifically hardwood plantings. Uh, year of establishment is really important. Uh, planting records, poll receipts, ideally the great thing is the councils are so good. Um, when, you, when they've been involved, um, those council records are invaluable. So you always you nearly have always mixed ages and locations. And uh, if you've got some information, we can work with that. But it's important that any ETS stand that's registered has a correct ageing and you can quantify the age that you've used. Shape is important, as I said before. Um, space planting puts greater significance on attrition and where those poles fall and um, when you're bridging areas and um, linking areas, um, staggered rows and, and just doing it in a sensible way that future proofs your stand and, and doesn't um, give any opening for liability in terms of attrition. The other thing is to consider timing. Um, with hardwood poles obviously uh, being deciduous, very hard to see on aerial image. Um, but depending on the season and as the growth comes through, um, they, are, they can be quite difficult to map without a, a good variety of images. Um, the thing about the ETS, as I mentioned before, is you've got the five-year compliance period. So any time you enter within that five years, you can claim back. So if you might be planting poles now, but you might be, put, be actually entering in the ETS a few years later when you can quantify their location, 
be able to ensure the shape of the stand, etc. So that's kind of me. Um, we're going to be doing some questions after. Uh, Stu is going to um, come up now and uh, just touch on the, the, the Crown Forestry Programme. And that kind of overlaps a little with the ETS um, and what I've talked about as well. So we'll be able to, to talk about um, to that after. And we've got a, uh, a banner that we'll be standing beside after as well if you'd like to come through and talk to us and, and we've got some information about other things you can take away. Thank you. Cool, thanks Margaret. You can see that, you're tall enough. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, so I, s I suppose the important thing about poplars and willows is that you're still farming underneath that. And um, if we get time, I've, I've put together a, a quick uh, summary of a 3,500 stock unit property and how we pull it down to below 30% below the 2005 level. So effectively an ETS neutral farm. Re really quite easy to achieve. So uh, the Billion Tree Program. Um, this is a carbon profile of uh, New Zealand, and what it effectively says is that we're currently emitting 80 million units a year. We're allowed to emit about 58 under the um, various protocols, whether that was the 1990 target or the 30% below the 2005. Uh, we're emitting that. Because we've got some trees in the ground, it looks like we're about 60 million. So the world looks at New Zealand and goes, clean, green, go for it, excellent. Um, the bluey line through the middle there are some credits the Crown gives to um, trade exposed industries. So if you're an aluminium smelter or a tomato and cucumber grower, um, you can get some NDs used to surrender so you're not impacted and time will tell how agriculture is approached. So there's um, our profile. These are the trees that are currently growing in the ground that suck it down to the black line. Problem is with trees, most of us that planted them want to cut them down. And so all those trees that were planted between 1990 and 1998 and 600,000 hectares, post-89 forest, makes look, New Zealand look really clean and green because it's busy sucking all the nasties out of the sky and pulling us down below that um, 60 million target. Uh, fifth worst nation in the world, by the way. We're really good at emitting. We've all got one and a half cars and none of us in a hurry to die, so we're doing it pretty well. As those trees get cut down, our profile's going up, and that's pretty much where we're heading. Um, and there's some implications with that, of course. And uh, one of them is world perception, because if New Zealand's out there at the moment at being 30% um, over its target, really, it kind of challenges the, the clean and green model. The other thing is there's a fiscal cost to that, because the government has signed up to a program that says, we're not going to do that we're going to keep our, our emissions down at, at such and such a level. And if we go over it, we're going to pay a price per unit to the UN or some Indians in Brazil or, or somewhere else in the world to effectively offset somewhere else. And at 20 million units, at $20 a unit, that's $400 million a year. And uh, you don't have to be a rocket science to work out it's better to spend that money in New Zealand than give it away to a Brazilian tribe somewhere else. And hence uh, the Crown has come up with this billion tree program and that says we're going to plant a billion trees over the next 10 years. It's really only another 450 million because we're already planting 550 million a year replacing what we cut down. But it's a real play and um, I'll, I'll run through some of those for you. Effectively what the Crown has said through Treasury is if you're a landowner with more than 200 hectares we want to enter a joint venture contract with you to grow trees on your farm. We will pay all the costs. We'll do some um, numbers to say that if we spend all this money and we get this much back, if we can make an internal rate of return of between 5 and 7%, this is how much rent we can pay you annually for your land. I've got some examples here. So it's a, it's a sound contract system, it's a 35 year forestry right you've got to be able to grow more than 450 cube over that period. And unless you're sort of halfway up Mount Cook or um, out to sea, that's pretty achievable. Um, that land rent gets negotiated uh, and the landowner gets to keep the carbon. And you've already seen what some of those um, 
yields look like on poplars and willows. I'll run through some for, for pine for you. Now currently this is a deal that's only available for, for pine, but it'll change over time. Um, all right, what else have we got there? Oh yeah, this doesn't work, okay. Um, so the Crown retains the forestry right, they, they cover all the costs, um, and they'll be negotiated individually. And we're currently negotiating on about 1,500 hectares for clients uh, with the Crown. Um, the landowner comes up with around 200 or more hectares, enters into this agreement, the rent will be indexed, um, and then you get kind of creative about do you capitalise the rent? So instead of get it annually, you might want the first five or ten years up front to cover off on loss of stock revenues. Or you might look at your carbon funds and say, actually between year six and eight, and if I put those three years together, I can afford to buy all this forest back off the Crown again and have my own forest. So there's all sorts of options. Crown are really keen to make it work. And um, yeah, so it's an interesting space. Because you've got more than 100 hectares, you can actually measure your carbon and that was going to deliver probably another 40 to 50% over and above the regional tables. Okay? So you won't see this, but what that effectively is, is a whole lot of calculations that says this particular forest is going to generate $26,700 a hectare. We drop that into a model here, we put some costs up there, and then we just change the land rent until we come up with an internal rate of return that fits within that mix. So on this model here, it's coming out to $150 a hectare. Uh, this land's probably might be running four stock units with an EFS of between $30 and $40, might be. Um, and then we transfer that land rental over to a landowner table, and we've dropped in some carbon numbers, and these are the annual um, revenues that start to flow out of that. Now that's just the first 10 years enduring carbon in that mix, okay? And I don't know if you can see that number. After 10 years, you're 1.4 million up. Um, after the next 10 years, you've got f about 500,000 in land rent. And then at the bottom, you've got to replant your forest. But the internal rate of return on that, if you're interested in those sorts of things, is, is well over 300%, because it's rich in cash flow and low in costs. Um, if you go out to the right, what you can't see is we set up spreadsheets to show what the stock unit carrying capacity is and everything else along the mix. This model's at, at throwing in 18 years of enduring carbon, and that um, second 10-year period goes from half a million to a, a little over $2 million, assuming a, a carbon price of, of $20. Now, if, if all these policies work and the carbon price goes up, and there's, there's talk about where that will go, um, we won't have a need for carbon credits in 40 or 50 years' time because we'll all be driving electric cars um, and we'll have our farms sorted out as far as everything else and the price of carbon will drop away. Which means if it's still high at 18 or even 20 or 25, people might decide they're going to keep taping the carbon. The key thing in here for us is we design regimes that can stay on the hill for 50 years and still have a good forest as opposed to one you've got to cut down at, at 30 or 35 because of uh, various things. So um, that forest, it's, it's netting about $26.7,000. They're getting $150 um, dollars a year in rent, and that's the, uh, the annual flow uh, through on an 18-year thing. I was on a farm this week. Uh, hasn't had a sheep on it for 15 years. They had a big flood through it, took all the fences out. Hasn't had any fertiliser for 15 years. Uh, we were there with one of Hannah's uh, teammates, and Ed reckoned $2,000 a hectare to get the fences up to speed, get the fertiliser up before you put on 2,000 sheep as well. So the landowner's looking at that and going, I can spend $2,000 plus buy 2,000 sheep, or I could spend $1,500 a hectare to plant it and get these cash flows, but actually I don't need to spend the 1500 because the Crown's going to do it for me. You could ride a push bike on some of this land. And so there's, there's kind of challenges around the policy settings and where they're going. Um, but equally for these landowners that are hands off, um, it's a pretty good long term option for them. Between now and the next couple of years, you will see more packages rolling out from the Crown on how do you take advantage of this sort of support for the smaller plantings. 
and I suspect that that, that will be done through the regional councils. Um, this is a quick example kind of to round off on, um, on a property just the other day up in Northland, 3,500 stock units, very efficient, high EFS. And we said, well, he's um, using Overseer, he was about uh, 3,500 uh, units, he had to drop it by 1,000 units. He already had some riparian plantings that um, he was looking to basically just keep cattle out of the creek. Uh, if we plant that up with trees for birds and bees, uh, he can put in probably 10 hive sites. He'll do a minimum of $500 a hive site, possibly 15, once those plants get established, because as you know, the bee industry in New Zealand struggles for 10 months of the year on where they're going to put their hives. Um, the carbon that will come out of that will be about 10 units a hectare a year. The biodiversity, of course, will throw a bit of poison around in September, October and double his bird numbers. Uh, he's got 26 hectares of poplar, but we just needed to link it up. So that's going to generate 22 units a year. So just between his riparian and his existing poplar, he's 800 units towards his 1,000 requirement. And he just happened to have 46 hectares out the back that's carrying about three stock units a year um, that we thought we could plant up. And so the net benefit out of very little um, inputs uh, was uh, reduced sediment runoff, increased pollination services year round. Because yes, the beekeeper wants to disappear, but if you have a coffee or a whiskey at the right time, you'll leave 20 hives there through the summer as well. Increased bird life, and for the loss of 180 stock units, and that's about a quarter of a million dollars over a 30 year period, uh, he, at the base hive rental, he's looking at 150. Uh, surplus NZUs, and of course he's got a harvest revenue popping out the other end. So that's your 200 plus program versus anybody can do anything. I'm not sure, I'm not game, I'm sure. Yeah, no, don't worry about that one. Right. So this last, if we went 12 months back, most of our clients are people like you in the room, they're farmers. Uh, we've traded on their behalf around $9 million of enduring carbon over the last 12 months. So this stuff is real. Um, it's not just a forest product, it's a farm product. There are obligations, but it's a matter of understanding them. Um, often we'll drive past properties that have got hectares of manuka on them, not in the ETS. Uh, if you know, Most areas of eligible manuka would generate um, in the last five year period, over $1,000 worth of carbon. Um, Margaret's already shown you the numbers around hardwood plantings for poplar and willow. Uh, we had a client in the other day, um, just looked at it and says, right, he says, well, I'm, I'm budgeted to put 500 plants in this poles in this year, tell me where to plant them. So the beauty of New Zealand is that we generate really good solutions and I'd suggest that there's a couple on the board. Um, we do an annual poplar planting program, sort of one paddock a year, roughly 100 poles. I suppose they're 8 to 10 hectare paddocks. Um, well, it, could it get to a stage that that is counted as a, at a per tree thing rather than me measuring canopy? Like there must be some formula of things to be able to work that out so that we've got 90 poles per paddocks that survive the planting. Yeah. Wouldn't it be simple just to do a count of that rather than the canopy? I think you could, but not under the ETS. So the ETS is a policy that has to be bulletproof and auditable. But there's two things that are happening in New Zealand at the moment. One is the ETS, which is a domestic scheme um, to, to make us all reduce our emissions. And the other is this chasing a thing called carbon zero. So if that's your emission level there, reaching your ETS target is as simple as going from there to there. Carbon zero is getting from there to way down. And I think it's in that carbon zero space, it used to be called the voluntary emission reduction space, VER. That's where you can go out to pre-90 forest or your single tree and go, we know how much that's sequestering, that's coming off my emissions, that's going on my Spring Valley Facebook page or website or, or whatever. So I think that that's, that's a space that um, is very easy to document in this digital age and something that's well worth doing on a brand by property basis. minimum area. Sorry, um, you skipped over just one slide there, that something about 160k per kilometre of 
Oh, they're cone heads, mate. They're dreaming. <coughs> no, yeah. yeah. Oh, no, there's, the, there's not many places, in all honesty, more than 160, about 200, 220 is the furthest we've got. Um, but the interesting... It just seems that, where, where's this land coming from? Oh, it's out there. Look, it's out there. Um, the, New Zealand's got plenty of Class 6, 7 land um, that's struggling. Um, there's a lot better land that's actually struggling. Is that suitable for ground harvesting? No, no, it's... it's that, that was the marketing blurb. So the, the three properties that we're putting in, uh, there's a little bit of ground base in it, but by far the majority is, is hauler. All the Crown or any investor really cares about is if I spend this much money, am I going to make a return on investment? And so the things that drive that, you know, if you're right next to the port, you've got no transport cost, you can log it with a wheelbarrow, you, know, you can afford to pay huge rent. The further out you get, if you're 200 k's away, you might be just looking at getting a lot less rent. But I'd suggest you'd have to be really bad to get less than $90 a hectare. And carbon's a bit like honey. It ha doesn't have a lot of transport costs. And so those carbon revenues still mix into that space. So having given an example of here's a property, they'll probably put the whole lot into um, a forest and buy it back themselves out of the carbon revenues. We're dealing with another one that's 1,600 hectares. 500 will go into forest. They'll never have to spray another gorse bush and they're going to have a really, really tidy pastoral unit. So there's, there's probably, I'd suggest there's more opportunities than challenges in the policy. Yeah. Cutting trees, eh? Makes your heart pound. <laughs> yes, um, uh, the Crown uh, supporting these schemes, what, what's their total budgeted amount? I mean, if we all pick up, pick up on them now, um, can they fund it? A billion trees? Uh, that's why I put that slide up that said if New Zealand is emitting 20 million units more than it's allowed to, it's either going to pay that money offshore or it can invest it in regional growth. And they've chosen the regional growth pattern. So I, the budget is, is, is not an issue. It's an investment, it's not a spend. Um, and there's immediate savings for the Crown and reduced. One of the big elephants in the room about this whole emission reduction thing is that every time a unit is issued by the Crown or the Crown is liable for that unit, it becomes a cost against the national books. And so um, the Crown can well afford to invest in keeping that, that penalty down. And in this case, they're choosing to invest it into land in New Zealand. So the budget's not an issue. Tree stock may well be, planters may well be, uh, but not the budget. And that's why I think in the next 12 to 24 months we'll see a lot more regional council initiatives starting to flow out that this is where you get to nod, Andrew. Um, <laughs> that, that bridge those gaps and perhaps make it more attractive. Or not so much attractive, but achievable. Yeah. Stuart, you, you've got up there uh, one of the benefits is reduced sediment runoff. Um, I'm from the Taranaki and we've had several blocks being uh, logged upstream from us over the winter. We could just about walk over our local river. It is just full of sediment. We've got issues in Abel Tasman, we've all seen that on the media. Um, what's going to happen you know, in 25, 30 years when all these billion trees get harvested? We're going to end up with a mess along our coastline, aren't we? It's going to come down to your uh, landowner and your regional council responsibility. So any logging job that's done to industry standard held within the bounds of the National Environmental Standard, it's a day and a half old, but prior to that there were plenty of district plans that said this is how you're going to do it and how you're going to affect runoff. Um, you shouldn't see that. Um, yeah, no, you are. So go back and get someone to benchmark it and say, well, what could have been done differently? But if you look at the long-term curves on sediment runoff, and they're available now, uh, you will find that unless it's a really bad logging job, the sediment runoff from a, a rotational forest is much less than a pastoral farm, and the sediment coming out of a, a, a rotational forest tends to be just that, whereas out of a pastoral farm it's, it's loaded up with um, all sorts of goodies going into the water system as well. So I'm not playing one off against the other, but what I guess what I am flagging is that if we can get on top of this whole best land use and hold operators to account, um, then that quite frankly shouldn't be happening like that. 
So you know, we've got a planting 12 kgs of fog grass on slopes like that, and we've, we've brought that sediment runoff down to virtually nothing. But I'm not disputing the fact that it's happening. Stu, the um, ETS was essentially designed around closed canopy forests for the big boys. And most of our non-forest land currently is growing grass in one form or another. And the people who own that land and service the mortgages need that cash crop to, to liken it to that. So I'm asking, well, I'm saying, you know, we need transitional regimes that are not closed canopy, i.e. not radiata pine, because radiata isn't suited to a lot of our really young sedimentary soils. Mm -hmm. And so who is playing with the regime slash species mix in this space? Because it seems like there's a great big vacuum out there. I mean, I mean it's instant what your colleague was saying about poplar. And I, you know, and I wonder if we need poplar regimes that sit at one or 200 stems a hectare of, of some of these nice, slim new varieties that look more like Lombardies than sailing ships, if you can forgive the analogy. Um, but, but who's actually doing it? Because we've got this huge gap in the knowledge systems out there. Yeah, well, I suppose we sit on the other side of the table where it's all in the top drawer. Um, and so, you know, there's Trees for Bees website will give you a great list of species by region uh, that you can plant. And if you start to mix that with stuff that goes over five metres, you, you step into the carbon zone. Um, the Poplar Willow stuff, Margaret and team and, and regional councils have done a huge amount of work on that. I think actually it's all out there. You've got farm forestry that's got a whole lot of stuff up on its website. All those things are there. It's kind of a matter of knowing they're out there and then making the effort to go and find it. If you live in the Varangus, just ask them. Stuart, I think it's perhaps worth noting that if we use our forests, we can actually get effectively a lot more carbon uh, bang for buck out of them. And in particular, the obvious one, for instance, biofuels. Uh, there's a hell of a lot of waste uh, timber just rotting around the place, turning into CO2 regardless. Uh, and I'm still yet to understand why you know, the government isn't actually pushing that one hard, because there are obstacles to getting it going, but I think once it was going, it could be all go. And just regarding the sediment one, um, I'm aware of at least four different studies looking at post-storm um, uh, surface slipping. And in every one, closed canopy forest is about 10% of the rate of uh, uh, pasture land. Uh, now, certainly we've had some major breakdowns in, uh, you know, with basically uh, slash uh, or... Um, you know, it's the slash that really causes the problem in some of the harvesting operations. Uh, I think, yes, there are probably areas that we can't afford to harvest, but also I think, you know, we can actually get much better systems to, to stop that, uh, that, slip, uh, that uh, slash and slipping. Mm. Uh, thanks, Dennis. Uh, just going back to that question about the, the planning options, you know, this, this property here, and if I put in a few more slides and maps and pictures and things, it would make more sense, but... You know, we're all heading down the track of having to keep stock out of waterways. Depending on how you put those fences in, you've got a huge array of plants you can put in there that are low profile. Uh, they're going to generate carbon, they're going to generate um, stability, reduce runoffs, and just uh, in the right place, um, either honey in the honey season or 10 months of, of home. Um, sorry? We, honestly, you can manage slash. You can manage slash. Um, You've just got to have the plan before you start, not afterwards. Yeah, uh, my question is just looking at the poplar and willow scenario. What happens when you get to that 40, 50 year period? You've got the whole farm covered in poplars, you've claimed all the carbon credits, and then the trees all just start falling over because that's what they do when they get to that age. What's the liabilities that we'd be facing in that scenario, and what Good options will we have? Because you can't mill them, can you? Okay, um, you will have instances of trees falling over at age 40, 50, 20 if they're in the wrong place, but by and large it's, it's an attrition that can be managed and you can replace. You can actually get into a managed profile where you start taking out trees and coppicing to come through and keep that alive. And trees don't actually stop growing at 50. 
Um, even radiata is still putting on volume at age 100. It's just the accountant wants to cut it down at 22. Right. Right. Sure. So we. Yeah. So would you plant a different species if you were starting over again? Yeah, and I think there's stands like that all over the country that need some sort of managing. Um, but it is manageable, even if it's just a matter of laying it down, painting the stump, and replacing it with something else. If you lay a tree down, cut the branches off, get the profile flash on the ground, um, you can start to look at, at changing it. Well, it's going to be a liability if you're losing a hectare at a time. If you're only losing a tree or two or whatever, and if you are losing a hectare at a time, you've got to ask the question, was it the right species in the right place? And, and maybe look at putting something in different. We, we plant a lot of low-profile flowering gums. Um, and yes, they don't have that longevity on, on carbon. This was a really interesting conversation that we had at the Poplar and Willow Field Day uh, a few weeks ago. Um, but in terms of your original question about you know, attrition of the older trees, it very much depends on their location and the size that that takes up. And by knowing that forest land definition and the ETS, by knowing where the line is and the rules of compliance, you can work to that line and be, be creative in your knowledge of how to keep that reaching the forest definition and linking things through again. So it's, 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 it is an obligation, but it's, it's manageable. Let's go through what we're saying. And because you're looking at the plantings generally that are in the scheme now have been established after 1990, um, those crack willows and those large ones are generally pre-90 at this stage. So they're not eligible for the ETS unless they're included within. So you can have up to a hectare gap within a stand. Um, so to have a whole lot wiped out is, a di is, a, is I, I guess, a different story. And I mean, we, we do um, carbon insurance for pine. Um, you know, is there a hardwood space in that insurance as well? That's a, that's a topic we can talk about later. Mm. And the other thing about carbon, remember, it's in the right-hand column of the spreadsheet. It doesn't say this is the right land use. It's a supplementary product that comes out of the right land use. So I wouldn't go planting poplars and willows just to generate carbon, but the simple fact that it's there enables you to cash flow a whole lot of opportunities. And if you plant now, honestly, in 40, 50 years' time, if we haven't changed what we're doing in New Zealand, uh, there would be issues. And I, I seriously don't see a $70 carbon price in 50 years' time. Do I see it between then and now? Plenty of people are saying yes. We, we don't model it over 20. It's there at 21 because we sold at 21.40 something yesterday. Um, but carbon is a supplementary income. I think it's got legs now because New Zealand is going to have a climate commission very similar to the UK model, and that's a non-political body that's funded by all parties. And in the UK, they run on three 15-year budgets, so they have approved budgets out to 2033 now. When that comes in, in New Zealand, and it's coming, you're going to see that politicians can no longer go on budget night, I want to change the rules. And that gives me some comfort that carbon is a product and a fiscal instrument, um, well, a fiscal return, is, is here to stay. So, but remember, don't go planting your land because you think it's a carbon revenue. That's not the right place to start. It's what's my best land use, what's my best species, and that could be merino or pine or manuka or kauri. Um, the carbon profile you put against that is, is just, it's just a matter of being aware that it exists. I think um, just a, a lot of those trees we planted years ago and we thought we'd just plant them and um and walk away and they'll be right for 40 years. Um, you know, I think probably the new trees, you can do that, but those old ones, you probably need to cut them down after 10 or 15 and let them come up again so the canopies didn't get so big, um, like you were talking. Um, I'll just wrap it up there. Um, thank you very much. Okay. Um, it's thought-provoking um, whether we should be planting or farming trees on marginal land and not so marginal land. Um, and also, it was interesting with the um, poplars, um, you know, there's science behind 
tree planting to get the greatest benefit for stock and being able to use the land for grazing and at our claim carbon credits. So thank you very much. Okay, I've just got you. a small gift here for you both. Thank you. Okay.